Ah, so nearby for us, so close we can touch each other. Very it's not green screen shenanigans. Don't touch me. Right, okay. <laughs> no, I, I know. no touch you. I know it's in your contract, yes. But what are we here to talk about today? Uh, well, we're going to have a chat about characters in films or TV that are being, I guess, incorrectly idolised. Oh, yeah, you missed the point by idolising. Yeah, that one. Oh, so bro, I pour myself a drink. Like this was inspired by you are rewatching Breaking Bad, yes? Yes, I've only seen Breaking Bad once. All the way through, yeah. yeah. And uh, Nisha and Adam said they'd rewatched it recently, so I thought I would go back. So I also want to watch Better Call Saul. Okay. But I thought I would uh, rewatch Breaking Bad first because obviously Better Call Saul, even though it takes place beforehand, there'll be a lot of references and characters by having been made afterwards. Yeah, as someone who rewatches Breaking Bad every year and watch Better Call Saul in its entirety, again after I'd seen it the once, like it does add a lot of depth and layers to that show. And you know, you've been rewatching Breaking Bad and we thought, let's do a fact fiend focus about just characters that the internet, we're on the internet, we talk about stuff on the internet, we talk about pop culture and media and movies and TV shows. Like, you know, that the the, the characters that the internet have just fundamentally misunderstood and have idolised despite the fact that the media they hail from 100% paints them as being completely in the wrong. Yeah, so obviously Breaking Bad is going to jump this off. I've been re-watching it and when I first watched it through, yeah. I, I never really thought about it, but now I'm watching it again with like slightly older eyes, I'm noticing that Walter's a massive prick. From second one as yeah. well. As like the story unfolds, and like, I'm only at the, uh, I think midway through season two, mm -hmm. but there've been so many examples so far of him already being a horrible person. Yeah. And I mean, we can, you can justify all you want and say maybe it was the cancer diagnosis and stuff, but like- No, he was always a prick. That's yeah. the thing. The thing about Breaking Bad is like, so we can, so I know when we talk about stuff like this, you always get like some say, well, no, you're not right. So like, we're going to quote Vince Gilligan right now, the creator, the writer, the person like the God of the Breaking Bad universe. Walter White was always a prick. Right. It's just that the Heisenberg persona allowed to act on those impulses. I, I, I don't, obviously, I, I haven't seen the latest seasons for a while, but as far as I'm aware, he used to be a partner in a really successful business. Matty, yes. Yeah. And then either was pushed out or left. No, that's the thing. He left. And that's the thing. Do you remember why? No. Because his girlfriend at the time earned more money than him. And he was insecure about her being richer than him. So Joe, when you have that thing of like, he doesn't want to leave Grey Matter. Yeah. Or like, you know, he feels like slighted by the fact he was pushed out of Grey Matter. They, have, they actually have a moment. This is why I don't understand when people misconstrue Walter White as the good guy or, like, you know, he was hard done by. It's like everything that happens to him is his fault. Yeah. Because the character, I think it's Gretchen, yes, straight yeah. up says to him, it's like, it's your fault. You left. That's your excuse? To build your little empire on my work? How can you say that to me? You walked away. You, you abandoned us. Elliot picked up the pieces, like, we offered you a job, you left the company, you took the buyout, it's not our fault. Yeah, because I, I remember, well, I, I misremembered mm -hmm. from my first rewatch, I thought that he was ousted. Yeah, because that's what he feels yeah. like happened. But in, in the early episodes, he goes to a birthday party or something at their place. Yeah. And I, when I saw that, I was like, I thought they hated him, I thought that he... Like you, they forced him out, but no, no, because they offered him a job. Yeah, and they, they offered him a job and offered to pay for his health. And they genuinely feel happy to see him, and that's one of the genius things about Breaking Bad is that it's kind of meta that you end up being manipulated by Walter because, like you said, you remembered it as like he got forced out of the company yeah. because that's the way he remembers it and it's the way he frames it to other characters. And even when you see, like, literally what happened, just laid out. You still don't remember that because, like Walter White's, like you know, twisted vision. I was like, you know, the meeting where he goes and meets Ellie, he goes to the birthday party. Yeah. And him and Skylar feel really left out because, like, you know, they were surrounded by all of Elliot and Gretchen's rich friends. But yeah, because he, the present he gives uh, him is the noodles. Yeah. And he feels embarrassed by it, but Elliot likes the gift. But Walter doesn't like, even though his reaction is genuine, he's enthusiastic, and he loves it. Walter still feels slighted because his rich friends view him. As yeah. lesser. Walter clearly feels uncomfortable that the gift he got his friend, even though as we saw, he got him the perfect gift, a yeah. reminder of, because like even say is what you're going to get a guy who has everything. Yeah. He got him a something sentimental, even though it was something that was obviously only like, probably cost him like 50 cents or something. Yeah. And there's a genius bit of um, uh, like set dressing in that. If you look, everyone in the scene is wearing white, except for Walter and um, uh, Skyler wearing blue, white collar, blue collar. Oh. So that's just a Vince Gilligan thing, but you know, just that's just like one of the, the lesser things. But then you have, you said, there's merch. Yeah. And what's the most iconic piece of Breaking Bad merch? Oh, is it going to be the the? Um, 
Oh, there's, there's two of them, isn't there? There's, there's two. There's yeah. Say my name. And there's, say my name. I'm the one who knocks. Yeah. Like so, that one. A guy opens his door and gets shot, and you think that of me? No. I am the one who knocks. And that's on T-shirts. And you'll see that I'm the one who knocks on T-shirts with, like, you know, the, the Heisenberg hat. And it'll be on shirts. And there'll be, like, you know, examples of that merch somewhere, I guess. Well, people have seen it. Do you actually remember what happens in that scene? Isn't he having a go at his wife? He's screaming at his wife. Yeah. yeah. That moment, which people hold up, was like the moment where Walter White's a badass. And if you go look at compilations like badass Walter White, you'll see that moment. And that is not a man, like you know, aggressively asserting his like masculinity and his dominance. It is a insecure, petty piece of shit screaming at his crying wife. Whenever he spends time with Jesse, he's acting like a big hard man. Yeah. And that's because he knows that Jesse is... Like, he views Jesse as being beneath him. Yeah. But then whenever the situation... Like, he even tries to act like that with, like... Um, is it Tuco he's called? Yeah. Tuco. Tuco. Tuco, yeah. Tuco, yeah. He even tries to act like that with Tuco until, you know, Tuco, the gun comes out or the aggression comes out. And then he pisses himself. Well, that's the thing. Because you... he's, he's pretending to be somebody. Yeah, and if you remember the, um, the I'm the one who knocks scene, what happens immediately afterwards is that's the scene where he gets kidnapped. And he starts screaming and crying. It's like the instant that he's actually faced the consequence of his action, or has to like back up what he's saying, he breaks down. He's a morally grey character, but as time goes on, you know that facade slips away, and that's as he gets more of what he wants and starts to feel better than everyone else. Yeah, but that's the thing as well. It's not that he becomes a bad guy; it's that he feels more comfortable being the bad guy he always was. Yeah. And you see glimpses, and that's what's fascinating to me of like discussions about this. Of like, even though the director, the creator, has themselves said. Walter White is always a villain. He, he's always been a petty, insecure. Like, everything that bad that happens is because of Walt's own ego. It's one hundred percent his own fault. He could have like saved himself at any time. Yeah. You'll get people to say, "No, you're wrong," because they like the character, and it's that weird internet brain thing of, "Well, I like this thing, so it has to be good." Like everyone always shits on Skylar as well, and I'll admit, like she definitely is a wet in, in some ways a bit irritating. Yeah, but. Does she kill someone though? Well, no. Does she melt a guy? The, the, the main thing that does she, she does. Does she melt a guy? <laughs> the main thing that she does is that she. Does she melt a guy? She, no, she doesn't melt a guy. She smokes while she's pregnant because her husband's a drug dealer, but does she melt a guy? <laughs> does she kill a kid? I'm not saying that she's better yeah, or that's, No, yeah. the, the, the gauge I'm doing here is like, I, I understand why some people have found her annoying. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that she does that people it, like, why she gets. It's, it's his fault. It's, it's also. It, he's causing it. It's also completely understandable and that the reaction people have is so vitriolic towards Skylar, which actually leaked out into the real with Anna Gunn, where she had to write an open like letter of like in defense of Skylar White, which right. is like, please stop harassing me, the actress who plays her. And that's the thing, like you can dislike the character, but the amount of vitriol like, oh she cheated on Walter, it's like he killed a guy. He manipulates everyone around him. Like he rapes her in one scene. Like he rapes his wife. And it's that thing of, of like, yeah, you can dislike the character of but the amount of vitriol and the, like, you know, the how it's, like, piecemeal out to the character. It's like, it's clearly not aimed at Walter White. And again, it's that internet thing of, well, I like this character. I like Brian Cranston. He's a good actor. He's a good character. He's a great character, yeah. but he's not a good character, quote yeah, He's a good character. He's not a good person. No. But people don't like that nuance there because that would require actually analysing your way of thinking. And there's other characters like this, isn't there? And we like come up with a few. Yeah, we? we had a chat before, and I think if we're gonna let's go from the the probably the more well known ones downwards. So yeah. the next one would be Rorschach. I Ro think. Yes. Ro people seem to love Rorschach. And we actually, Rorschach is a psycho. And we encountered this because we did the video about um, uh, the Watchman. Yeah. Like, uh, about like, Dots Manhattan's big swinging blue dog. And we mentioned in that that Alan Moore hates Rorschach. Like he literally wrote Rorschach to be a psychopath. He like he took the idea of Batman of a person a vigilante who beats up criminals without due process, took it to its logical extreme, and then turned it into a character. Like, the most, like, you know, satirical, balls to the wall, insanity version of this character. And he, to this day, gets people coming to him, I love Rorschach. I love Rorschach. It's like, he's a psychopath. Like, he literally, there's a quote from him, he's like, he is a psychopath. He is insane. And we actually had responses to that video of people saying, well, are you saying that you should let child molesters go free? Because he beats up, he just, in one scene, he beats up a child. It's like, what about all the other people he beats half to death? I'm saying, like, I'm not saying child molesters should go free. I'm just saying that no criminal should be beaten half to death. And like, I didn't think I'd need to say that in today's, like, political climate when you have, like, shit like that happening to actual people all the time. The lack of, like, nuance 
that mm -hmm. some people can see in these kind of characters. Yeah, it's like, well, he only, he only beats up criminals. Like, but that's the thing, though. What about when he's wrong? Yeah, and also, uh, who, like, why does he get to make the decision exactly, as to whether yeah. that who, criminal yeah. deserves that much pain? Like, we're not talking about the charm molester here. I'm thinking about the one in the prison, the prison yeah. who he like, burns the face like, off. What, what's his crime? Yeah. Like, he, he came up to him in, like, you know, a prison and threatened to stab him. Okay, yeah, sure. But is, like, is it, and that's when you'll get, there'll be people who are annoyed about that, but he was trying to kill him. But does that mean he's just going to be fry -elated? Like, and it's that thing, that you have the ability to defend yourself. Like, it's the whole thing, isn't it, of like, when people do have the ability to defend themselves, like, you have the control to, like, well, disarm that, that guy. Like, Con Air is an example yeah. of that. Yeah, but we also have it in, in Watchmen. Would you like, the guy shoots and they talk to Dr. Manhattan, like, you could have turned the gun into steam. You could have turned the gun into steam, the bullets into mercury, the, the bottle into goddamn snowflakes, but you didn't, did you? You're drifting out of touch, Doc. You didn't help. And then Dr. Manhattan realised that he is a villain. He's, like, completely apathetical to society's, like, ills as a whole because he no longer sees people as worth saving. Yeah, like, Rorschach could have definitely done something other than melt a guy's face yeah, on Yeah, but then that, that happens to Rorschach. And I think people miss that. And it's not even subtext. It's the text. The parallels are, like, one-to-one -one and people still miss it because they think Rorschach's cool. And the story frames it as like, you know, or at least the film frames it was only beating up criminals. And no, none of the people who idolise him ever stopped to think. But what about if, like, you know, I'm deemed to be a criminal? Like, what about if, like, you know, I'm a guy who just now happens to be, like, you know... It's like, how many cases of mistaken identity? We've had two this week of people being shot for being in people's driveways. Yeah. It was two separate cases of that. And, like... And I don't think it was a single person either, like, that's not a horrific, horrible story. That's basically what Rorschach's doing, of, like, he's making a snap judgement in a moment. And that's why, you know, it's the Batman thing taking it's logical. Not even logical, like, it's the most illogical extreme, of, like, Batman beating people half to death. And that's another one people don't like when you criticise Batman. But, like, but the police are incompetent in his universe. Like, but they wrote the universe for him to always be right. But you can't apply his logic to the real world, which people try and do. Of like the whole idea is like an allegory for our world, and if you actually had that in our world of a guy who just goes around beating people, he wouldn't always be right. He'd eventually be wrong. Yeah. And when he was wrong, that'd be horrific. And that's why you have stuff like due process and innocent until proven guilty. Like, imagine the recovery time if you got beat up by Batman. Oh yeah. Because you don't just get beat up by Batman. You get like completely incapacitated. Like, let's let's use for example the opening scene of the most recent Batman. That first guy that Robert Pattinson takes down. Oh, yeah. He beats the shit out of that guy. Yeah, we even talked about like, in that, um, uh, I think, one of the early videos we did when I took over editing, where like, Robert Pattinson himself says, yeah, I want that guy to never forget that Batman beat him up. It's like, what did he actually do? I find... What did he actually do? Except, like, you know, kind of threaten a guy? Yeah. I Does this... that justify being, like, like, disabled for the rest of his life? Let's move swiftly on to another character where this happens. And I think this is a... Not the earliest example, but it's probably one of the most famous, and it's Tyler Durden. Yeah. Like, how... Like, Tyler Durden, people that know. Fight Club, written by a gay man. The fight... This is, like, an in, inarguable fact. Like, Fight Club was written by a gay man um, as a direct teardown of the idea of toxic masculinity. People watched Fight Club, did not realise that that was the case, went out and started Fight Clubs. <laughs> people started actual Fight Clubs after Fight Club came out. Because they didn't realise it was a piss take of their entire, the, the idea of like, that whole opening scene of like, I live in a shitty Ikea apartment as it pans around Edward Norton's pretty nice apartment that anyone watching at home will be happy to live in. I mean, that's a separate issue entirely. Yes. The number of people in TV shows and films who are like, oh, this crappy place I live in, that's this joke, mediocre yeah. existence. That's the joke, isn't it? Like, I feel completely dead and all that. So, well, that's your fucking fault. Mm. Stop making it all the, oh, what does he do? Rather than like, you know, grow as a person, get some therapy. He blows up a building. He becomes a terrorist to make it everybody else's problem. And again, the parallels to modern life are just like so eerie of like, young man feels like he's like, you know, just disenfranchised. What does he do? Makes it everybody else's problem. Starts committing like acts of mass terrorism. And people still don't get that Tyler Durden's the villain. Like, he's a cool character. Yeah. Brad Pitt's a great actor. It's an amazing movie, some solid performances. Tyler Durden is not the hero. You like him, he's the protagonist, but he's not the hero. And that's the thing, isn't it? Of like, yeah, it's like, oh, um, I don't feel alive. And he, uh, you know, recapture. Men don't feel like they're like alive anymore. It's like, what's well, your fucking problem? Get a hobby. Get a hobby and go to therapy. You're not like that classic one, isn't it? Of uh, on Tumblr. Like, yeah, 
we, men need war. War is necessary for a man to feel alive because he can't feel alive unless he's like you know actively taking a life. His so response is like, you're not Achilles, go to therapy. <laughs> it's like, like, you're not Odysseus, go to fucking therapy. What a strange thing to say. You no, know, it's, it's, some people think that. Like, how, like I said, guys start actual fight clubs because they want because they agreed with the message. Even though like you know Chuck Powell, you know I think they pronounce his name. I, I'm always bad at pronouncing that guy's name, but it's like he wrote it as like a piss take of like the overly masculine men who feel like, oh, I need to fight. Do you know, like guys get drunk on a weekend and beat yeah, each other yeah. up? He wrote it as a piss take of them, like that's what they need to feel alive, even though in his head that's the most empty existence he could think of. Do you have another character from the list? Because we had like you know, that rough list of stuff. So the, I remember that Eric Cartman was one that came up. Oh, I didn't understand there were any people who viewed Eric Cartman as anything other than a villain. No, what it is is... He's the bad guy. No, it is. It's that people watch South Park and don't get that it's satire. Oh, no, I, I have seen this before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They think, like, so this is a, it's a problem of South Park and Family Guy and shows of its ilk where people watch it, usually men, usually online, will watch it and they laugh at it, not because of the things it's satirising, but because Cartman says bad words. They don't realise that Cartman is the villain. Yeah. Or like that, that he gets his comeuppance in a lot of like They just like that he makes fun of Kyle for being Jewish. And they feel emboldened. And it's one of the, the criticisms of those shows is that they don't do enough to show fucking morons online that Cartman is not right. Because a lot of because obviously he's a fun character to write. Because it's really fun to write a sociopath. So I don't know Peter Griffin. Like, you know, the shut up Meg thing. You know, have you ever seen those interviews like Myla Kunis, which like I get people calling me to tell me to shut up in real life because they think it's funny, even that like the show doesn't do enough to show that Peter Griffin's an asshole, yeah, even yeah. though every episode is that. The one thing that I get the most of is shut up, Meg, on the street. Like people, <laughs> all, the all the time, I will walk down the street and be like, <laughs> shut up, Meg. The point of like Trey and Matt have always said is that they take hits, they take shots at everyone, mm -hmm. and so there are going to be some episodes of South Park or some messages they try and teach which yeah. we don't agree with but there have been so many situations where they have tried to make a point by having the arsehole or dickhead characters like Carmen or like Randy Marsh try and make a point about something and the joke is that it's those characters making yeah. that point. Like, the joke is supposed to be like if you believe what if you believe this you're as bad as it's the same yeah. thing with Always Sunny mm. it's the exact same problem they run into of like the, the, the reason I had to take down episodes, like the blackface episode, even though like, you know, they make a pretty, in my opinion, nuanced point, they took it down because so many people didn't realise that you're not supposed to like the characters. Like, the fact that they're making these awful arguments, the same arguments people make in real life for defending stuff like blackface or all the other taboos that they break, the, the fact it's coming out of the mouth of these fucking morons who are always wrong is the point. But people don't get that because, well, they're the main character. I like the main character. I like Rob McElhinney. Yeah. I like Kate and Olsen. They're fun characters. How can they be wrong? I like Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito's a nice guy in real life. Did you see the uh, music video thing that Ryan Reynolds made for his birthday? Yeah. McElhenney, I think it was. Yeah. It's McElhenney, McElhenney, Huawei's to massacre and mispronounce it there. But that's, that's the other one, yeah. It's another thing they run into for just... So it's not that people are idolising the characters, they don't realise the character's wrong. Men online, there's a lot of them who don't feel like they have an identity. They don't feel like they're something they can attach themselves to. And that all results from them just not feeling comfortable in who they are because the hyper-masculine idea of what a man should be is one, not accurate, yeah. and two, not reflective of what a lot of men are. So I feel like, you know, especially like nerdy guys, a lot of nerdy young guys, like they don't conform to that hyper masculine ideal, so they feel alienated by it. So they attach themselves to something that, like, you know, does allow them, something they can do. It was a big issue for me and I guess a lot of uh, guys my age when we were growing up. Yeah. That the the support, like, there's this idea of what a man is supposed to be. Yeah. But the thing that a man is supposed to be is really difficult to be. And like, obviously, we know women struggle as well. Like the idea of what women are supposed to be, but we can only speak from our own experiences. Mm. I think that's what it is. A lot of men don't conform to what the hyper masculine idea would be. Feel alienated by that. Do you know what is my advice? Because this is the advice I always give. Talk to a woman. And what I mean specifically is talk to a woman um, uh, who you trust and uh, are not attracted to or want to sleep with. And if you don't know, have a woman like that in your life, that's the problem. <laughs> and like, you know, a lot of these characters are, tend to be misogynistic just by their very nature. And the thing I've always said is, and like a lot of them are, they, uh, they give men. Like this specific kind of men we're talking about, 
this false idea of what women like. And you can see this like happen live of um, like when women try and talk about what it is they like, of like, you know, what attracts you to a man, and they'll say, like, oh, sense of humour, this, like, oh, does hype bother you, for example? Mm. That's like a very common one. You know, people have commented on that in the comments right now, but do, does hype bother you when it comes to a man? And like, you'll get 99% of women will respond like, not really. Ha but you'll always get a man correcting like, yes, it does. Yeah. Because it bothers them. Even my, like, in my own mind, those things exist. Because when you mention it, and you're saying like, oh, people are saying it doesn't really matter. In my mind, I'm like, but it does though, doesn't it? But that's the thing, if you I'm, I'm shorter than other guys I know. That makes me less attractive. But if you talk to like, you know, a woman that you trust and like know, and you ask them that, most of the time they'll say, it needs they do. That, you know, and there's someone, some women, some women do. I mean, I've come to learn well, not that all I, of them, and that's the thing. Not women aren't a monolith, yeah. and that's the problem. I've come to learn that I care more about how I look than other people do. Oh, it's the same thing. Yeah, it's it's something that I think people need to remember. Is that like it, the way it was explained to me? I think it was um, I can't remember who it was who said it, but they said um, they were like, "Did you go out earlier today?" I went, "Yeah, I went to the supermarket." And they said, "All right, so uh, who served you?" I was like, "I, I don't know, some guy." What did he look like? I don't, I don't remember. Know. Yeah. It's like, what about the people behind you in the queue? I, I don't remember. What about the people you walk past on the way? And I generally don't remember. It's like, well, that's how they think about you. They're not going to look at you and judge you enough for it to make any kind of like worthwhile impact. Yeah. You're just a person. That's and you, you care way more about how you look than other people do. And that's the thing I've always said, like in regards to the, just ask a woman that you know and trust. And if you don't have a woman in your life, you do that. That's probably part of the problem because I've never understood. Like, I guess, I guess I do kind of understand. Like, you feel lost and you want to talk to people in a non-judgmental way. A lot of the time, like you know, when you have like these burgeoning misogynistic thoughts and like mindsets, the only people who are really going to talk, like you know, let you in and talk to them are like, other misogynists, and they'll massage your ego enough and tell you that you're right, and tell you that you know, oh yeah, all women are gold diggers and all that good stuff. As I thought, like you know, the, the the whole the Andrew Tate men's rights activist and stuff like that. When if they just went and spoke to a woman and actually spoke to them and realized they're people. Well, they don't want to do that because they've got this image in their head. Like it's the same reason they idolise these characters. Is they see them one way, and to see them a different way, or to it in a more nuanced way, would break that illusion. I my background, like academically, is media. I literally have a degree in like media and communications. Like, breaking down media and like you know its messages, its themes, what it's trying to say, perhaps what it's been interpreted as, like all that good stuff. That's the kind of shit I love. It's why fact feeding exists, and when. Something that always frustrates me when we try and do that, people tell us that either we're thinking too much about it, which is, to me, a really sad way of thinking about media of like, hey, you're thinking too much about the piece of media you're consuming. That's it, that, I, that depressed me. Like, so do you not? Do you just, you want to be just like a completely passive observer of the things that you enjoy? Mm. Then also it's like, um, it's just a film, a game, a TV show, a book. It's like, well, it's not because media influences like every aspect of our lives. Whether you know it or not, and the people who say it doesn't, 69. Nice. Hello there. And that's the kind of shit like, that happens to everyone. And, like, it's, and it's always frustrating for me when people say, oh, no, that's stupid. And I have it like an anime avatar. So why did you pick that avatar? Like, I like this character. Why do you like that character? It has an effect on you. Mm. Like, or you chose like some part of what how this character is presented seems to resonate with you as a person. It influenced you. I believe you wanted to talk about Senator Armstrong. I did. Would you like another drink, Mon Uh Yeah, go on then. Well, I can get you one. Go on. Yes, treat me. Uh, yeah, so speaking of, like, you know, people getting mad when I break down media, I replay on my streams, you can find a link below, every Friday, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. And by that point, it's not I have a drink when I stream. <laughs> but I start to get, like, really hype about, like, just how overt the politicalness of that game is and just like how obvious to me as someone who studies it it is like a teardown of right-wing politics yeah of like you know just some like brief examples of stuff like armstrong being like you know might makes right of like no it does like but i'm stronger than you what does that fucking mean you don't know anything like riding no shit but he's stronger than you or like stuff like the quote people say he says make america great again don't make america great again what the hell are you talking about? Which people attribute to, oh, it's a prophetic Donald Trump prediction. It's like, no, it's a quote from Ronald Reagan. And the reason he says that is because it's supposed to be, like, you know, a, a pastiche of, like, what Republican ideals are. Like, oh, he's a literal strongman, posturing on stage like he's doing a fucking wrestling promo, just saying things that sound good. 
to a crowd that doesn't exist. Mm. Like he's just repeating things that sound good to a crowd that he's trying to appeal to. And if you actually listen to his speech, he completely flips his like, pers- like perspective on issues multiple times. And then his speech ends with him saying, I don't write my own speeches, which means he doesn't believe anything he just said. And if you go look at like, clips of his speech on YouTube, or half comes like, well, he's, got a, he's kind of got a point. It's like, no, he hasn't. Like, he himself doesn't believe what he's saying. But people think that he does because they like the character and they don't get, even though, and I don't think it's subtext, it's the text when Armstrong says, I don't write my own speeches. Who's idolizing Senator Armstrong? It's not they idolize it, people say he's got a point. Because, I mean, people said Thanos had a point. Yeah. yeah. And it's again that thing where he, he breaks down this thing and he makes a lot of like, he says a lot of things that sound. The thing I always find about when people say that this character has a point is that they're not saying the character, like, well, they, they, they don't mean that what the character is doing is right. What they're saying is the, I can kind of see where it's the reasons from. they're doing it might have to be like founded in something. Mm-hmm. Like they say Thanos was right in that he thinks you should do something about overpopulation they of resources. Don't think that, though. They just think he's got a point of killing everyone. But killing everyone, I mean, it's been established that that doesn't fix anything. No. You can also just, like, click your fingers and double all the resources. Every time I stream that game, every time I stream it, I'll point out, like, this is so overtly liberal to me. Because it is, like, you know, a direct teardown of, like, right-wing talking points. Like, Armstrong, I said, a literal strongman, posturing on stage, making, like, vague statements that sound good that are immediately countered by Ryden. And it's like one of those things where like it's basic film school shit of they're having an argument back and forth as they fight. And it's like Ryden is physically, literally and metaphorically parrying Armstrong's arguments and punching him in the face. It yeah. could not be more obvious that the game is framing Armstrong as wrong. And people say, well, he's got a point. Doesn't he use orphan brains? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're using orphan brains like fund a proxy war, and that's the thing. Yeah, and like, but there's you'll see like countless comments like, yeah, he's kind of got a point, or like, you know, his way of like looking at the world is like, you know, it's it's accurate, or you know, just Metal Gear series in general. There are people who don't see it as a political series. Never forget the legendary image of like I love, or I miss when video games weren't political, and it's Fallout, Metal Gear Solid, and I'd love to believe that's satirical, but I've met like you know in person and online and interacted with enough people where like, I think they're, they're being serious. Like, they don't, they legitimately, and the, the argument I always make is, if you don't, like all media, all media is political. Every piece of it. Every bit of media is political. If you don't think so, it either agrees with your politics or you're too stupid to realise it. And I remember when I said that once and the smarmy, shit-ass response I got, well, what about fucking, I think it was like Dora the Explorer or something like that, or some like kids show. And how many kids shows can you think of right now where like a key ethos is just respect everyone like regardless of the differences? Any media, like all media has some kind of political it does, background yeah, but, to specifically it. Specifically of kids shows. Like yeah. how many kids shows are just respect people? Well, most of them. Almost all of them. And yeah. how many like, you know, kids shows that are live action like, you know, have like an ethnic and diverse cast of kids? And there might be people watching that like, of course kids like media should like present that message. How is that political? What's happening right now with trans people? Like, rather than just respecting their right to exist, even if, even if you don't understand. Like, you can even see it on a kid's show, can't you? Yeah. Of like, oh, well, you know, little Timmy doesn't feel like Timmy, because like Sally today. And like, you can see the, you can see the kid's show in your head, can't you? Of like, and, you know, and that's fine. And that would get like, you know, raked over the coals, like trying to politicize an issue. It's like, all kid's shows forever have done that. I've, I've never understood this argument people have of claiming that something is becoming political, or it's becoming too like Fac Fiend was a bad example yeah, of like this. I said, like all it's media becoming is. too political. And my response to that person, like seeing like a kids' TV show, is like, yeah, kids' shows are because a key ethos of kids' shows is that you should respect other people despite their differences, well, I, and you should like you know appreciate their differences and allow them to like you know present themselves the way they feel comfortable. That's a pretty political issue. Also, the fact that you think. The level of media literacy you possess is like a kid's show. That's the level you feel, that's the piece of media you feel comfortable being able to like decisively say what its politics are. It says a lot about you and not me. I would argue that those kind of things, I wouldn't even describe them as being overly political because... Well, that's the thing. It shouldn't be. The idea of respecting people yeah, just... for who they are shouldn't be, but it is. 
the the baseline, the human baseline of respect. Yeah. No, don't be a dick. Yeah, and that's the thing. That, but that's political, Brad. Usually online, I try and avoid steering too deep into those kind of topics. Well, like when it comes to the thing of like respecting someone's right to exist. The thing that annoys me the most is just don't be a prick. This is the thing that bothers me the most about just society in general. Like, if you hold a viewpoint and you think to yourself, is this viewpoint hurting people? Yes, change it. You're being a dick. But Brad, it makes me feel uncomfortable. And if I'm uncomfortable- Then I, grow up! No, it's that legendary tweet from Bird's Right activist on Twitter of, I am uncomfortable when things are not about me. I remember when I said trans rights in a video once, I got like a really angry message from someone like, why do you feel the need to say that? Why do you feel the need to make your content political? Like, well, I've directly interacted with trans fans who felt, when I said that, so they felt welcome because the general feeling of animosity online makes them feel unwelcome in a lot of communities. And I did not want that to happen because I want my videos to be enjoyed by everybody. Yeah. And they just couldn't get that. Because in their head, that's, that's so alien to them. Like, what do you mean they're not accepted for who they are? When like, that must be bullshit because they've never experienced that kind of discrimination. So to them, it doesn't exist because they can't fathom what it'd be like to have someone just fundamentally disagree with their right to exist. And to bring it back to what we talked about earlier, of like, you know, men who don't feel like they conform to the hype idea of like what masculinity is. It's like, it, the great irony is it's like, it's the same energy. It's like they're on the same spectrum. Like, you don't feel like media represents you. Media is not representing like your lived experience and you like to see that. But rather than fight to have what you feel is yourself represented on screen, you try and emulate what you see. And just like, you know, you try to become this like basically fake version of what you think you should be rather than your true self and just like fight to have that represented, which is, you know, trans people want to see themselves represented where like the weird guys who are misogynistic and insecure, like try and conform to the fake idealized version of what they think masculinity is. So that of like, I, I, I don't like that you being political. It's like, and the most, all we really say is like, hey, 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 you, if you're from, you know, a minority group that's not regularly represented in media, or you don't feel like um, uh, you're like, truly acknowledged or existence is respected, it is here. And like, you know, if you're a fan, you're a fan. Yeah. And we appreciate you. We want you to like, you know, continue living your best life. And we would like for you know, the world to accommodate you as best as it can so that you can continue to like, you know, exist in the, you know, and function and just, you know, just live your life the same way anyone would be expected to. And people are like, I didn't know you thought that. It's like, all, the, all I hear is, I didn't know you gave a shit about other people who don't look like you. I grew up in a very like predominantly white working class colliery town for many years. Mm. But being online and being like, exposed to like, you know, so many more different viewpoints, like, I've interacted with a lot of fans who fall outside of that like, you know, incredibly narrow definition. And as a result, and you know, and it's that classic George R. R. Martin quote like how how do you write such interesting female characters? Well, in my experience, women tend to be people. It's that same thing, like, you know, interacting with all these people with all these different backgrounds, they're just people. Yeah. And they're just like, they just want the same thing that most people want, which is to be left the fuck alone. It's like my stance, and it applies to every single person that I try and communicate with, is the person you're talking to is another human being. Unless they've got they've, a dick. Well, no, but they, they've got lived experiences, they've got their own beliefs and their own uh, ideas of et cetera, et cetera. But, and you, I go into all conversations with that idea in mind. And then if they prove themselves to be a dick or to be somebody who's not willing to listen, then that's when you disengage. Mm -hmm. But for, for anyone out there, like just try and just treat everybody nicely. They don't think that in their head because that would make them the villain. What they actually think, what they're actually thinking is, in my opinion, is that I don't understand this and therefore feel left out when it's discussed. It's that thing, isn't it? You know, you're having a conversation about, you know, a movie and people and someone hasn't seen the movie, and you see and they withdraw into themselves so they don't feel welcome in that conversation and then every now and again they'll like interject with something that's completely unrelated but so they can steer the conversation back to something they feel that to be an authority on it's that on a macro scale they're like they don't understand this issue or they're not welcomed in the discussion because they either don't have any perspective or input that would be valuable or just they're like you know uneducated on it and because of that rather than admit okay that's not for me or i'll let these people have that it's like well no i want to be involved mm -hmm. Alcohol! Oh, hello there! 
No, don't worry, you're not interrupting. I'm just reading myself a lovely passage of this book written by our patrons, the ones who keep the channel alive and allow us to keep making shit like this. What was that? You'd like to hear an excerpt? Well, I do have with me an excerpt here via our VIPs. Would you like to hear it? Of course you would! Here it is just for you. <laughs> Patrick Bradson, Benjamin Fridman, Shea Pinder, Joe Noah, Sarah Paul, Liam, Aero QC, Kynan Plays Games, Jet Road, Binga, Popsicle Tart, Rotoscope, Chenere, Andy Ellis, Joshua Knapp, Jace, Jacob, Ursenback, The Fez Wearer, Samuel Chesser, Anna Goo. <laughs> if you'd like your name to be one of these ridiculous end segments, you can do so by joining the VIP tier on Patreon. That's right, it keeps us afloat, you know. <laughs> okay, that's enough. <laughs>